All right. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm, uh, I'm super psyched to be here. I, uh, I've spoken at the Web Visions Portland event for a number of years, and last year uh, I didn't get to make it because uh, right before the event I woke up in uh, ICU. I had fallen ill the night before, uh, basically passed out, and uh, long story short, ended up being diagnosed with a condition called uh, common variable immune deficiency, which basically means that I don't have much of an immune system. And the treatment for this is, is not really that big a deal. Uh, I go in once a month, once every four weeks, and I have an infusion for a day where basically they pump a new immune system into me, and then I'm good for four weeks. And it's cool. And it's just a day out of my time. But in that day, uh, what I've taken to doing and what I I've, I've had done for a long time before that in all my hospital visits is I talk to the nurses. And I ask them about what devices they're using and what those devices do and how they like using those devices. Because now that I'm there regularly, there's always something new. They're switching out devices really quickly in new systems, new processes. And so we get to talk because I'm sitting there in a chair for eight hours and it can get really boring. And the nurses bitch. And they bitch a lot. And they tell me about all these things that are supposed to make their lives better and they don't make their lives better and how this system is screwed up because it doesn't take this into consideration and that. And I wonder, why? I'm a designer. I've been working with MadPow for uh, five years. I was a designer for 10 years before that. Uh, I know a lot of the people at these companies designing these devices. I know how smart they are. I know how creative they are. And I know what they have the capability to do. And I wonder, why is it that organizations with these talented individuals are still churning out things that so many people are pissed off about? And it doesn't just happen in the medical industry. We see things like Windows 7. Not very successful. We see things like the Fire Phone. Hit like a ton of bricks. And who can forget Quickster? Did everybody forget Quickster? Probably. It didn't go over very well. What I understand in working with the projects that I've taken on and seeing things like this and talking with friends in the industry is that there isn't necessarily a correlation between having design talent and being successful at design. We see designers being hired in mass amounts right now. There is such a craving for design talent. Everybody is starting to recognize what kind of a differentiator design can be. And these designers find their way into organizations and they try to do their work and they struggle. They struggle a lot. So myself, my team, my colleagues at, at MadPow, we, we asked ourselves, what kinds of characteristics have we seen? In the projects we've taken on, the teams we've worked with in other organizations, what kind of characteristics have we seen that help us understand right up front, right at the very beginning, whether or not that team is going to be successful. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about five characteristics that we've found. These are not the only characteristics, but these are five of the most common and sometimes most overlooked characteristics that we've found in teams that are able to be creative and productive, that are able to come up with really great ideas and see them through to execution. So let's start our examination by reviewing the roles, the average roles in any given project. First, we have people on the business side, right? We have stakeholders, product owners, analysts, subject matter experts. These are people involved in making the business run. And then we have design. These are the people who we expect to come up with ideas, right? These are the UX designers, your information architectures. These are the people that are gonna define what the thing you're gonna make is. And then we have development. We have the people that actually make it real. And right? so these are the, the roles that everybody thinks about. 
And the first challenge that we find when we talk about the design process and we look for these characteristics was this idea of the design process itself. Where does the organization, where does the team we're working with think that that, that process resides? And in a lot of cases, it resides with the designer. Or at least that's the perception. So we see business teams come up with a bunch of requirements. Business requirement documents, maybe you've seen them. They're hundreds of pages of long and they look like shit. We see the development team come up with a bunch of constraints. And then both of those get shipped off to the designer, go make something. The problem with that is, is that the design process is way bigger than that. The design process is this process by which we set goals, we set objectives for something we want to create, something we want to have happen. And then every single decision that we make not just about what something's gonna look like, every single decision we make is a design decision. And that means that we have to ask a lot of questions. Who are we designing for? Where are they gonna use this thing? What are they gonna try to do with it? All of these questions, and all of those are things that the entire group has to be able to answer, that they have to have input into. So the design process is not just something that the designer does. It's something that the entire team does. So that's characteristic number one. Now let's assume that you've got that. A lot of you here probably have highly collaborative organizations. You get together in teams, you have workshops, those are great. So you've got this process by which you're bringing everybody together. Now, it's fair to say that as you do that, everybody is gonna have their own idea on what you should create. Lots of ideas. Lots of ideas are awesome. The best way to find a great idea is to have lots of ideas. We want that. But lots of ideas can also trip you up. Lots of ideas can hold you back because when you have lots of ideas, how do you figure out which ideas you're gonna pursue? How do you manage all those ideas throughout this process? So what we need to eventually be able to do is to get everybody together and centered around an idea, one idea, the idea we're gonna follow and see through to the end. We end up working with a lot of organizations where they have trouble doing this. They have trouble letting go of ideas and just focusing on something. And the reason that happens is because there isn't a leader. There isn't somebody there who can actually guide the project. We need one person to be the keeper of the vision, to make sure that all the decisions being made are in line with that vision. With collaborative organizations, we often find this this reliance on consensus. Consensus is great, but we see teams that are working to try to build consensus. And I have a problem with that phrase, building consensus, because to me it implies that your objective is to get other people to think the way you are thinking. It's to convince others. And that detracts from what you're really trying to create and do. We should be working on finding consensus. Where does the team already have agreement? How do we leverage that? How do we build upon that? And that's what a great leader does. A great leader is able to use the team's combined mental power and creativity to put together a vision, inspire people to make it happen, and drive towards those results. So who is that leader? Who is the best person for that job? We find this person missing in a lot of cases because often there's some executive stakeholder or some product owner. They don't necessarily have the vision. Sometimes we'll find a designer 
or somebody else on the team, even a business analyst or a developer, who does have a vision, who is able to put all these things together, but they're not in a position where they can communicate that and inspire people and lead the change that's necessary. The best leaders that we found are people that have had some experience in all of these pieces. They understand the business. They understand design. They understand development. They can take all these things and put them together, and they know the language within each domain. In Shay's talk yesterday, he uh, gave an example of how he and his teammate Darby switched jobs and how that led them to have a much better understanding of what the other thought, of how they interpreted things and how they behaved. And that's what a great leader has. They understand all of these roles and how they all play together. So great teams, great organizations have this leader and they have a vision. This does not mean that there is some one person who is driving everything, who is being a complete dictator. But that person is able to take a team, inspire them, use their combined creativity and intelligence to establish a vision and drive towards it. Forcing people to focus. Forcing people towards that production of that final vision. So we've got everybody involved. We've got a leader. This is great. Let's talk a little bit more about process. And let's focus on design and development. Common problem that we see with organizations is this wall that ends up between the two. I want you to think a little less about people right now and more about just the acts, the acts of design and the act of development. Right? What we find happening sometimes is that there's this separation of thinking and building. And so there's this process by which we think about what we want to make, and we write it all down, we sketch it all out, whatever that might be, and then we throw it off to this other process, development. Now we're going to build everything that we drew out. And we run into problems with that because if you think about it, really the creative process is one of evolution, of this evolution along fidelity. From low fidelity, which is the initial inkling of an idea, to high fidelity, which is what you're actually going to put out in the world. And these acts of building and thinking don't exist at opposite ends of this evolution. They both exist throughout it. Because as you are thinking about things, you can use building to further your thinking. And as you're building things, you can find gaps in your thinking that need to be addressed. This is the common issue we see with teams that still have that wall. They send off their designs, development starts creating things, and they come back with a, well, what did you mean here? You said you wanted to animate in from the left. How fast? What style of animation? Right? All these types of decisions that haven't gotten made yet, that need to be made. Gaps and considerations. And so these two acts need to live simultaneously throughout the creative process. So it's not two separate phases. They're going on together. It's not just that developers are involved in the sketching and designers are involved in development. It's that the two acts themselves are actually happening at the same time. The project model is often the model we see organizations use for resourcing. This is pretty common. How many of you have ever been assigned to a project? All right, everybody pretty much. The project model is one where we figure out all the different roles we're going to need because someone somewhere has had an idea of something we're going to make or something we're going to change, something we're going to do 
they've gone off and they've pitched it to enough people that they've gotten buy-in and somebody's given them money. So now they assemble a team, that team gets together, and for a set period of time, they work on creating something. What happens at the end of that project? More often than not, those people go off and they become part of other project teams on new projects. And it's not uncommon in any one organization to find 10, 20, hundreds of projects happening simultaneously. What this means, though, is that we miss an opportunity. We miss an opportunity to do real design. Because real design is, it does not have an end point. It is infinite. It is iterative. It moves from observing a situation, learning what we can from those observations, creating or refining some kind of solution, putting that out in the world, and starting that whole cycle over and over again. And so the project model is horribly inaccurate and inadequate at letting us do that. Because that team that has created something and put something out in the world has now gone off to do something else. They can't evolve their understanding. They can't learn more things. They can't push the thing that they've created even further. And eventually, maybe another project comes around that's going to touch that same thing they created, but it's a, it's a new lineup of people. And they need to start from square one again. And this is why redesigns are so prominent because that team is essentially starting over. This model also has a tendency to build silos because organizations that follow this model tend to centralize all of their skill sets. So all the designers exist in some centralized unit. All the developers exist in some centralized unit. And those people just get shuffled off into projects. And silos create walls. They don't give us systems by which team members on a project are working towards the same goals. And so the better model that we've seen is a product-based model, where teams are assigned to a certain thing they're going to create, a product or a service. And they stay with it throughout iterations. They go around and around. They stay there. They have that continuity. They can further their learning with each iteration. They can further the thing that they've created. And sometimes people swap out, because sometimes after a year or two, people are like, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this. I need to go focus on something else. And that's OK here and there. But the project-based model has those people swapping out in droves all together at once. So great organizations that we've worked with understand this. They use product-based models. They keep teams together. They keep things going. They budget so that iteration after iteration after iteration can happen. They often create some kind of centralized channel for the different, say, designers on different products to come together and make sure they're working towards a consistent strategy and a consistent vision, or developers. But still, their main alliances are to the products. The last characteristic I want to talk about today is about people. These skill sets, design, development, business understanding, organizations have a tendency to treat them like cogs. HR does this all the time. This is one of my biggest problems with uh, with modern HR, is that you have a skill set. You have a gap in a skill set, and so we need to fill it. So we're going to go, and we're going to look for someone who has that skill set as best matched to what we need. Because the idea is that if we have all the right cogs, we're going to put them together, and we're going to do amazing things. Skill sets are one very small piece of who a person is. A person's values, their beliefs, their principles, their behaviors, all of these other pieces will affect how they work within your organization. Those things need to line up with others. 
You can have the most badass front-end developer ever. They know everything inside and out. But if they don't have some shared values and beliefs with the rest of the team, it's not going to work. So great organizations understand that when they put teams together, it's not just a matter of collecting skill sets. It's a matter of finding the right people. It's a matter of making sure that the team you are creating to execute on a vision, to put together something and create some better future, that they have an investment, a desire, a shared set of values towards that future you are creating. That they are going to want to make it real. So great organizations look at people as a whole, not as a skill set. Talking about these things is pretty easy. These are all characteristics I've observed. These are all challenges that I've seen teams face. It's super easy for me to get up here and just talk about them. What's not easy is actually changing an organization. Changing culture is extremely difficult. Because culture is this vague, non-concrete thing. We can't put our finger directly on culture. But culture is what influences these kinds of characteristics. Your culture manifests in the value systems you have, the processes you use, the processes you say you want to use but diverge from because you can't make agile work in your organization or lean just doesn't seem to fit or whatever that is. You have espoused beliefs and espoused values and you have reality. It manifests in the way you talk to one another. It's everywhere. And all of these things reinforce each other. And this is why change is so hard because to just simply go in and say, change a process all of these other manifestations of your culture are going to be fighting against it. But it's not impossible to change culture. It's not impossible to find better ways to work with other people. No matter where you are in an organization, whether you're at the bottom or at the top, there are things you can do to start to change the relationships you have with other people. And that is primarily what I'm talking about here. It's the relationships you have with the people that you're working with. The foundation for changing culture, the foundation for making creative productivity work, is to look for trust, to look for shared values, to understand what each other are trying to achieve and find the commonalities and build on those. It will be slow, but every win is just that, a win. And it will grow over time. So look for opportunities to build trust. That's all I'll leave you with today. Thank you very much. I've got plenty of time for questions, and then I have to run to the airport. Any questions? Yes. Yes, next month. Oh, I have a whole talk on critique I could do. I can't do it in this time frame, though. Um, yeah, so uh, the book, Discussing Design, uh, one of the kind of uh, the underlying constructs in great collaboration is the way we talk to one another. And critique is a big component of that. Uh, critique is uh, this structure in which we compare what we've created to our objectives and try to determine whether or not the decisions we've made in our creation, the design decisions, are actually gonna to work towards those objectives. And in collaboration, this is really important, because as we discuss and share ideas, 
try to figure out which direction we're going to go in. Right? We often end up in conversations of who likes what better, right? And we ask for feedback, and we get things like, oh, that sucks, or that's horrible, or I would never use that, or you should have made that blue, and that should have gone to the left-hand side because it would work better over there. And none of those things are particularly helpful in those discussions. But critique is. Critique is critical thinking. Critique is taking those initial objectives and saying, how well does what we've created actually work towards them? So this book is all about how to do that. It's all about how to give and get better feedback from your teammates, from your uh, clients, from stakeholders, from a person on the street, whatever the case may be. Uh, so that's that. It'll be out next month. We are finishing that up actually right now. Any other questions? Uh, have you ever actually experienced a change in culture in your work environment or heard stories about it? And if so, yep. um, how did the conversation go? Yeah. So, uh, so the role that I play right now, uh, it's, it's interesting. So this has been, uh, this has been a, a side interest of mine for uh, about as long as I've been a designer. And last year, we decided to make this thing real. And uh, the role I play right now is Vice President of Organizational Design and Training. What that means is I actually go into organizations and help them understand where their challenges are in being creative and being collaborative. And so I have seen it happen. And what it takes is a real commitment to change, to understanding that it's going to take a long time, to understanding that it's going to mean admitting that we're doing things that are hurtful, right? And what we do is we, we start by working to understand culture. We start by looking at the processes, we look at the policies, we look at the ways that teams work together, we shadow those teams, and we just observe for a while. And we try to understand what kinds of relationships are people having and why. We talk a lot about how people perceive the others on the team, right? And so this is where, we start to look for where is their trust and where is their distrust. Distrust is primarily where we start to dig into why is that happening. This is probably why people aren't collaborating. This is probably why the culture is holding them back because people perceive that other people are trying to do something that is working against their objectives. So I'll give you an example. We did uh, a workshop with a major financial organization. In this workshop, the objective was to try to shift the strategy of the business, of the organization as a whole, towards financial wellness, towards being all about helping customers understand their entire financial picture and how that was either helping them or hurting them. The workshop was requested by the design team. The design team asked if we could bring in the marketing team and the product management team and some more of the business in, and we could help them all kind of center on this idea, help convince the rest of the organization that this was a good thing. On the side of all these conversations we had setting up, I had this one designer, the one who was helping me organize it on their side, and she kept telling me about, you know, Bill over there in, uh, in product management, uh, he's going to be a problem. You know, this isn't going to be anything he's going to care about. He only cares about conversions. It's all that matters to him, right? And this would happen every day, and every day it would be some other person that she was talking about, and how they were going to be a problem, how they, they didn't really care about the customer or they had this other set of values. And I picked up on that, and it made me think about, okay, well, what kinds of activities can we do to suss out where people's values actually lie? And the activity we chose is called a fishbowl activity. Has ever, anybody ever done a fishbowl? Okay. So the fishbowl that we constructed was, uh, we, we, our seed question was, what is the role that large financial institution plays in 
helping customers be financially well. And we took each role, each kind of uh, unit, designers, uh, product management, marketers, et cetera, we sat them in the middle, and we had them just talk about that for half an hour. And everybody else is on the outside, completely silent, and just taking notes, things that they've observed, comments that people are making. And, and we kind of pushed the question and things, and we challenged people a little bit, but it's mostly just an open conversation. At the end of it, what was striking is that a lot of the design team, including the person that had been telling me about how all these people were going to have different values and weren't going to care, they started to realize that as, say, the product management team was talking, that they were actually talking about all the same values that the design team had been talking about. They all kind of wanted the same thing, but they all perceived each other as having different objectives. And so the rest of the workshop was extremely different because it wasn't that they had these assumptions about how they had to kind of negotiate and work around each other. It was more that now, now we've got this shared value system right in the middle. We've all seen it. We've talked about it. We've made it explicit. We wrote it on a whiteboard. And it changed the conversation for the rest of the workshop. It changed the dynamics. So I have seen it happen, and that's carried on. They actually you do the fishbowls uh, regularly now, which is interesting to me. Um, but they make that part of their, their projects up front, is they try to figure out what is each group trying to get done, trying to accomplish. And they look for those commonalities. And where there aren't commonalities, where there are discrepancies, they make addressing those part of that upfront work. Because they know now that not addressing those is going to bite them in the ass later. So it has changed their culture. Any other questions? Hi, you, you've mentioned several things that um, I'm, I've long been an advocate of changing language to do critiques and uh, build, finding consensus. But for, if a small organization was going to pick a priority as an inroad, as a starting point, what's mm -hmm. maybe the biggest priority? Can you repeat the question? To pick one thing that's a starting mm -hmm. objective to sort of then make inroads into many of these topics, what's maybe the biggest one to start looking at? Uh, I really think. Uh, the biggest thing is, is understanding perceptions and how, uh, how groups perceive each other. Um, because that's at least, un values is, is where we've found kind of the most common uh, or most effective uh, place to start looking. Because if we can identify the values that people have and what they're trying to do in terms of how they should work together, then we can start to figure out what do we need to work on. Well, they all have the same values, but they're using different languages. You know, they're taught business is saying this, and design is using terms like kerning, right? And all these things don't line up. Okay, well then that's, so it's a language issue. We have to address that, right? If they don't share the same values, then we can start to try to understand why those values don't, uh, don't line up. So sometimes we'll do empathy exercises where we'll say, okay, it's quite clear right now that the business is not sharing the same uh, values as the, the design team. Why? Because the business doesn't seem to be understanding enough about the users, or the, the customers, or the members, or whoever we're, we're designing for. Well, the design team might already be doing research, might be presenting results there in the, the form of reports or something like that. And so we understand that that's not effective, so we'll do, uh, we'll do more things like contextual observation. We'll take stakeholders out in the field and have them watch people, have them do interviews and things like that, right? So understanding the values and where the values align or don't align is really the very first step that we always take in any kind of organizational design project because that's what shows us where to start our work. Can you give um, an example of how the workflow might look different when designers and developers are working in tandem versus, yep. you know, designer does design, sends it off, gets feedback? Yep. So, um, so one example uh, that we've seen and, and used is uh, it's essentially like 
I don't want to call it paired development or paired design because it's, it's two bodies working simultaneously. So we'll have the designer and the developer sit together, right? So they're, they're actually physically side by side. Uh, and we have them work together on addressing everything. So they'll start by being given some kind of problem or today we have to work on figuring out the login system or the login flow or whatever that's gonna be, right? And so they start by sketching together. And typically in these situations, the development team uh, already has some kind of framework laid out. Or I've actually seen developers using Axure or something quick that way, something that's at least somewhat familiar to them. Right? So as things are being sketched out, they're also kind of assembling that on the fly. So and what's that, what that is allowing them to do by kind of putting it in a medium that they are more closely in tune with is they start asking themselves all the questions that they would normally ask as they were if they were developing on their own. But they can now vocalize those questions directly to the designer and say, okay, well, if we're gonna put that there, where exactly should this button go or how should the button behave? So they're actually making those decisions in tandem. Does that help? Up front here. Um, so one of, I think, kind of the running themes that I've, I've seen through this talk has is, is been sort of a, a mantra that I've really advocated for a long time now, and it's kind of around the, the coexistence of thinking and making. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I very fundamentally believe and that we've set up, especially you know, throughout the history of kind of post-industrial revolution design, this has been two dichotomies, right? These exist in two different places. So I think what I'm, what I'm asking is that when I talk about that fundamental coexistence with clients, they're like, yeah, totally, we get it, that's yep. awesome. When I ask them to actually apply it to their business or apply it to their design team, the anxiety is palpable, mm -hmm. right? It's like I'm asking for their firstborn son. Yep. So like, have you ever, I guess, dealt with that? Um, or like, how have you handled that? I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, so that gets to kind of understanding what it takes to change, and so when we, so I'll talk about this in two capacities. I'll talk about this in an average project, like a, a product design project, and I'll talk about this as an org design project. Uh, in, an org des uh, in an average project, uh, you know, we run into that and, uh, and we kind of have to feel out, like, how willing are you able to, to take that kind of an approach uh, and, and make do with it, with the, whatever they say. On an org design side, though, we always need to check to see kind of how committed are you to making change and understanding that you're going to have to make sizable differences in how you work. You're gonna to have to really shake things up. And the, the thing is, like you said, they often recognize it's completely logical. They often also recognize all the pain that it's caused them in the past, right? They know, yeah, we spent you know, an extra six months on that project because we had back and forth between party A and party B or whatever the case may be. So we bring up those kinds of cases and we ask them, what would you do differently? You know, if, if I bring this case to you, if I say you're going to have to change this process, what would you do? How would you do it, right? So we kind of put the onus on them to come up with the solutions. And by those solutions that they come up with, we then ask, okay, how would you make that happen? Like, how would you actually go about and do that? And then they'll say, well, I would have to go get approval from this guy or that guy or all of these people. And we say, well, can you actually do that? No, I can't do that. And so we have to try to figure out, okay, what is your level of influence and what can we realistically do within that? And that's, that's kind of this, this reality set. Uh, and we try to make sure that we incorporate that into our work because if we just walk away and say, you need to dissolve this team, dissolve that team, and create a new team over here and walk away, then that's not gonna happen. So what we do is we, it's, it's basically like any design project with a set of constraints. We say, we understand that having this team here and that team here and having them work in this capacity is difficult because they're throwing things over the wall. But we can't change this team's existence or that team's existence, so what can we do? And we work with them to try to figure out the solutions. So they become invested in the solution and finding something that actually works for them, and then we go through and, and do that. And another thing that we do uh, as part of these projects is coaching. So because these kinds of change efforts take a really long time, 
And because there is no silver bullet right up front, you have these six problems, these are solutions to these six problems, have a nice day. Instead, what we do is we say, okay, we have these six problems, let's brainstorm some possible solutions, let's figure out which ones you wanna try first, okay, you go try those and we'll help you implement them a little bit, and then we're gonna set up a weekly call or a bi-weekly call or a monthly call or something like that, and we're gonna check in with you and we're gonna see how that's going. And where new problems arise, we're gonna brainstorm with you on the fly right there what kind of little things you can do to shift, right? And so we're constantly iterating through, through this coaching mechanism, and that's been helpful too. The thing is, is to stay on it. And that's where I think separating out org design from other projects, from other product design projects, has been good for us. Because when you're trying to change culture or process on the fly within the context of creating some new product, it's actually very hard in the larger organization, right? Because these types of cultural changes take so much dedication, having them called out, having them be their own initiative and being able to apply that kind of focus and uh, resilience on them is really important. Does that answer your question? Great. All right, I think that's about all we have time for. And I gotta go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs>